Psalm 23 with me, if you will. Psalm 23. Again, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one there in your pew, maybe underneath of it. The scroll the verses will be up on the screen. Psalm 23. This is a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever." Of the 150 psalms that we have in our Bible, there is no doubt this is the most famous. It has been referred to, this 3,000-year-old poem has been referred to by Charles Spurgeon as the pearl of the psalms. The early church father, Augustine, because so many martyrs would cite and quote this psalm as they were going to their death during the great persecutions, referred to it as the martyr's psalm. James Montgomery Boyce said this. He said, millions of people have memorized this psalm, even those who have learned few other scripture portions. Ministers have used it to comfort people who are going through severe personal trials, suffering, illness, or dying. For some, the words of this psalm have been the last they have ever uttered in life. This is one of the most familiar passages in Scripture in all of the Bible. No doubt you have all heard this multiple times. You probably have it written on cards. Every time I go over to the funeral home, I I see it on the remembrance cards. And as I was thinking about it this week, I think that very often we misapply this psalm. In the 30 years that I have been a pastor, in nearly every one of the funerals that I have done, I have read this psalm. It is an incredibly comforting psalm. It is used by soldiers on the battlefield. It is a comforting psalm. Unfortunately, what we normally think of it because of one line in it, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we refer, we've, we've kind of made this a psalm about death, but it's not. We've misapplied it. It's really a psalm about life. And what I would like to do this morning is to kind of bring it out of the funeral home and bring it into our lives. I'd like you to come in and show that there is something very practical and very helpful for every single one of us in this psalm. I agree with one writer who said the 23rd Psalm has been shrined on a marble pedestal for too long. We need to take it down, break it up, and use it. And so this morning what I want us to do is just kind of walk through this psalm together, and I, I'm just going to warn you right now that I, I'm almost intimidated to preach this. I've been pastoring for 30 years, and I realized something this week. I have never preached on the 23rd Psalm on a Sunday morning. I've taught it on a Wednesday night. I've been through it on Sunday nights. I've used it in nearly every funeral, but I don't believe I've ever preached from it on a Sunday morning. And I am not going to begin to tell you that we're going to get into great depth. Honestly, we're going to scratch the surface of this psalm this morning. But I pray that what we're going to do is get real practical to show you how this psalm can help you in your life. And so I want to show you three things that are taught in this psalm, three things that are very important. The very first is, is that God desires to have a personal, intimate relationship with you. Notice how David starts out this psalm. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, we really honestly don't know when this psalm was written in the course of David's life. Many suggest that it was written very late in his life. As David is looking back over his life and reflecting on it, David is looking back and he's realizing, through all of the years that I have lived, the Lord has been my shepherd. I don't believe that. I think it was written when David was young. 
I think it was written back in those days where David was out there with his father's sheep in the field and the incredible glorious truth dawned on him that just as I am the shepherd of these sheep, God is my shepherd. That is a very vivid picture if you think about it. David could have said, the Lord is a shepherd. In fact, sometimes the Bible does use it that way. The Lord is a shepherd. Sometimes the Bible says the Lord is the shepherd. But notice what David says. The Lord is my shepherd. It is a personal thing with David. It is an experiential thing with David. David is recalling the fact that God has personally walked with him all the days of his life. In those days where he was out there uh, tending sheep, the Lord was his shepherd. On that day, on that mighty day when he went out to meet Goliath on the battlefield, the Lord was his shepherd. In all of the days that he was king, the Lord was his shepherd. It's one of the most amazing facts in all of the Bible, is that God, the creator of the universe, wants to have a personal relationship with you and with me. We really see that personal nature of God in the very early chapters of the Bible. When God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, let us make man in our image, it's interesting there. We're getting a a picture of the dialogue that's going on between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three persons of the Trinity have lived in a personal relationship from all eternity. And when they make us, when God creates us, He creates us in his image, and and we're created for personal relationships. Now, we know that that, uh, God makes Adam and Eve so that they can have this personal relationship, but more importantly than that, God made them so they could have a relationship with him. And when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, he is reflecting that God has entered into a very personal relationship with him. Now, today, for you and me, we have to acknowledge something. That relationship that we're created to enjoy has been broken by sin. Genesis chapter 1 says we're created in the image of God, but Genesis chapter 3 shows that we have fallen into sin. And the Bible is very clear about that, is it not? In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, the Bible says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's the Old Testament way of saying what Paul said in Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The very fact of the matter is when we walked into this building today, we all have a common problem. We have a sin problem. And sin has separated us from God. Now the good news is, is that God has taken decisive action to remedy that problem. Amen? He sent his son Jesus into the world to die for us. In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, and a few days before Easter, we celebrated Good Friday. And we remember Good Friday as being good, not because the events there were so happy, Jesus was crucified on that day. But it's good because of what Jesus did for you and for me. He went to the cross, and he bore my penalty. He bore your penalty. God says, you have a problem. The problem is your sin has separated you from me, but I've got good news. I'm sending someone who will remedy that problem. He sent his son, Jesus. That's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, at some point in your life, you have to come to a point where God becomes your shepherd. Where it's not just a shepherd or the shepherd, he becomes your shepherd. It becomes personal. I can remember that day in my life. I was about 10 years old, and and I'd gone to church that night, and the preacher had preached out of John 3.16, and and I wanted to go forward that night, but because I'm kind of shy, I didn't. I remember taking a a little track home and reading the track that led me through what we call today the Romans Road. 
It told me about the fact that I'm a sinner, that Jesus died on the cross for me, and that if I would simply repent of my sin and place my trust in Christ, that he would save me, and you know what? He did. And from that day forward, I can say with David, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, i got a question for you this morning. Before we even get started too deep in this service, has Jesus become your Savior? Can you say, the Lord is my shepherd, not on the basis of sentiment, not on the fact that you grew up in church, not because your mom and dad were believers, but Jesus has become your Savior. Why? Because you've turned from your sin and you've trusted him. If not, today is the day for your salvation. But even as believers throughout our life, We grow in our intimate relationship with the Lord. From that moment of my salvation back when I was 10 years old, my life didn't stay the same. It kind of changed. It kind of went over time. The Bible teaches us that uh, that, that, that we're to grow in our relationship. You know, shepherds in in, in David's day had a very close close relationship with their sheep. Um, You know, of all of the sheep we can think about, there are some wild sheep. You know, if you go out, there's, there's longhorn sheep that live up in the mountains. When they, the Bible talks about sheep in the Bible, it's talking about domesticated sheep. Domesticated sheep are one of the oldest domesticated animals that man knows. Man's been domesticating sheep for as long as we can remember. And sheep have become very dependent on human beings. A, a, a sheep gets into a very close relationship with its shepherd. It's it's like nothing you've ever seen. Uh, The sheep will learn to distinguish their own shepherd's voice. I can remember a number of years ago watching a video of a group of shepherds that had come somewhere in in Israel, and they had brought their flocks together and put them in this sort of common area for them to rest and sleep overnight. And it was time for them to go their separate ways. And and the shepherd would simply stand up and he would begin to make this little bit of a noise. He would begin to kind of call out to them. I don't remember what they were saying. They were saying something in Hebrew and everything in Hebrew sounds like you're clearing your voice. So it was kind of like, you know, just making a noise. And the sheep would recognize their shepherd's voice and would follow. And the next guy would get up, and he would would make a sound. It sounded exactly the same to me, but those sheep knew their shepherd's voice. The longer you walk with Jesus, the more deeply you become aware of his voice and learn to distinguish it among all the other voices that are out there. Sheep get comforted by their shepherd's presence. A very interesting thing, and we'll talk about this in a moment, when he says he makes them to lie down. Sheep by nature are skittish animals. They're afraid of almost everything. They, they are, they're, they're imaginative animals. They'll come up with things to be afraid of that they're not even real. But when their shepherd is nearby, he comforts them. Sheep are, uh, uh, get to know, the, the shepherd gets to know the individual personalities of his sheep. He recognizes the differences. Isn't that good news? When God compares us to his sheep, it's not really the most, honestly, it's not the most flattering on our end. It doesn't say much good about who we are, but it says a great deal about who he is. And he's reminding us that we're invited into this constant relationship where we trust and obey him. So the very first thing we've got to to wrestle with this morning is, is he your shepherd? And if he is your shepherd, if there's been a moment where you've come to know Jesus, are you walking in that close, intimate relationship with him? Or are you running off? and wandering, and doing other things that you shouldn't be able to be doing. There's a second thing that that we notice here. Not only does God uh, uh, desire to have a personal, intimate relationship with us, but we also see that the second thing the psalm teaches us is that God takes care of us. God takes care of us. You you see that in the very uh, next phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. Look what he says, I shall not want. This is an expression of the believer's supreme contentment in his or her relationship with Jesus. In in a sense, it is both a declaration and a decision. 
Think about that for a moment. When David says, the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He is declaring something there that is true about God. He's declaring that God is going to take care of every need he will have. Amen? He, every need you have. Now, let me say this to you. There's a big difference between our needs and our wants, right? What, what we want sometimes is a Cadillac. Like what God sometimes gives us is a Volkswagen, although Volkswagens are pretty expensive today too, so I don't know what, 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 the, what a cheap car would be if there are any today. But the idea is sometimes we want something that God says, no, you really don't need that. You really don't need that thing, but I am going to give you exactly what you need. The shepherd makes sure that the sheep do not lack anything. Psalm 34 verse 10 says, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. God provides for our needs, amen? He makes sure that as believers, everything we have need physically, he provides, everything we need spiritually, he provides. It's a declaration, but it's also a decision when David says, I shall not want, he's saying something about God, but he's also saying something about himself. What he's saying is, I will be content with whatever God provides for me. In other words, David says, you know, there's probably some things out there I'd want or maybe I'd desire that are outside of the will of God, but I'm going to learn to be content with everything that God has given us. Now, that sounds strange to an American ear. We live in a perpetually discontented society. We're always, I mean, think about it. I, I, I use this illustration. Uh, I'll, use, I'll use Max because I always use Max. If you're here new, Max is my grandson. He's two years old, going on 24. The other night, it was funny, I was sitting on the front porch, and they live just down the street from me just a little bit, and I heard Mackenzie going, Max, Max, and I could see little curly hair popping through the field, running towards my house. That has nothing to do with the sermon, I just thought it was cute. <laughs> but Max loves to come in my office or at the house and watch things on television. He's two years old, but he's also, he's, he's Constantly discontented. Uh, turn that on. Put uh, Mickey Mouse on. You put Mickey Mouse on. Two minutes later, pap, 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 handing me the remote control. Pap, pap, pap. Uh, uh. That means change the channel. So then we put on cars, and he watches five minutes of cars. And by then, he's had his car uh, fix filled. And then next thing you know, uh, 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 pap. We got to put Toy Story on for five minutes. Then Toy Story 2, and then Toy Story 3, and then Toy Story 4. And then we got to put on a couple of, he's constantly discontented with what he's watching because we get bored so easily. Watch us when we get something new. Within 10 minutes, it's old. We're a con constantly discontented society. But I want to say this to you. If you want to grow closer to Jesus, you have to learn to be content. You have to learn the spiritual art of contentedness. Listen to what 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says. Godliness with contentment is great gain. He says godliness with contentment, being happy with where God has placed you and what God has given you, and looking and saying, God, how do you want me to use this? Here's our problem. We want God to use us in big ways, but we're not willing to do the little things. If you want more from God, you have to learn to use what he's already given you. Be content with where God has placed you. I tell that to young pastors all the time. A few days ago, I had a young pastor call me up. He said, Joe, I, you know, I've been here at this church for a couple of years now. Things have been going. Now it's time for me to move up. There was his first warning sign. There's his first, because he thinks that bigger is better. That's a mistake. Bigger isn't always better. And I think it's time for me to move up. Would you recommend me? And I said, no, I won't. No, I'm not going to do that. Don't put me on your resume. And he says, why not? I said, because you haven't learned to be content with where God's placed you. And if you can't do that, you're not going to be content in the next place. And you're going to treat this like it's a career, and it's not. It's a calling. 
If you don't understand that, you better go ahead and just go do something else. I wasn't being mean to that young man. I was being truthful with that young man. We need to learn to be content. David declares, I shall not want. He decided, I shall not want. Then he goes on and he provides us a list of ways that God takes care of our needs. If you're sitting here and you're wondering, how does God take care of my needs? Well, I got good news. He's going to give you a list of them. And I'm going to kind of combine some things up. And you may say, there's, there's other things here, Pastor, that you missed. That's true. I'm only touching the surface here. But let me show you four ways that God provides for our needs. First thing he does, he calms us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Remember a few moments ago I told you that sheep are by nature skittish animals. I learned something about sheep today. I didn't know this. Sheep have four stomachs. That's weird. Some people think I have four. I don't. It's one really big one. When its first stomach is full, after it's eaten and its first stomach is full, what the sheep naturally wants to do is to lay down. And then it will, this sounds kind of gross, but for sheep it's not. They regurgitate a little bit of that, they chew it, they chew the cud, and when they get it all chewed up a little bit more, they swallow it, it goes into the next stomach, and then on through. Now, the problem is sheep are very skittish. If there's anything in their environment that is disturbing them at all, they won't lie down. In fact, by, by nature, domesticated sheep don't like to do this. They need to do it, but they don't do it. So the shepherd comes, and notice what it says. He makes them to lie down. He comes and he causes them and, and he gives them this comfort and, and let them know that I am here. And as long as they know the shepherd is there, the sheep can relax. Why? Because the shepherd's going to take care of any predator. The shepherd's going to make sure they got everything they need. They can be calm, not because by nature they're calm, but because the shepherd is there. I want you to notice this. We live in a society where anxiety is on the rise, and I'm not criticizing you if you have anxiety. I struggle with it too. But I want to say to you, the greatest thing for anxiety is to know that the Lord is near. He's your shepherd. He is providing everything that you need. So he comes and he gives us calm. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As believers, our job isn't to be anxious and fret and wring our hands over everything, but instead look to our shepherd and say, Lord, you know what I need. Lord, here's my concern. Here's what's bothering me. Here's what's troubling me. And Lord, I am putting it all on you. And Lord, I trust that you're going to take care of me. He calms us. He refreshes us. Look at the next phrase. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Now, that phrase there, he restores my soul, is interesting. It literally means in Hebrew, he turns back my soul. Literally, we could say it this way. He makes me new. He comes back and he refreshes me. Have you ever been really, 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 really tired? And you sit down and get a nice cool drink of water? Or you eat a nice meal? I can remember a number of years ago, uh, we took our kids to Disney World. It's been about, what, 10 or 12 years ago, Grace? I don't know where she's at, but it's been a long time. Sarah was just a little thing. Sarah was still enamored with princesses. And Matt was too, by the way. He was 16. <laughs> but for very, very different reasons. But I can remember we got to the park. And man, it was just as soon as you hit the ground in Disney World, the mouse takes over your life. And he's like, well, you got to run. You got to get here. You got to get there. You got to do this. You got to do that. And I can remember one night, well, that first night when we got there, we had flown in. We checked into the hotel. We went over to the Magic Kingdom. The kids went nuts. They want to start riding things. They want to start doing things. And, and uh, man, the second day comes along. And, man, it is just, they are running. And, they are t and here I am. I'm just worn out. And then God provided me an oasis. I heard 
the enchanting sound. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. And I got me a lemonade, and I rode It's a Small World for two hours. <laughs> they'd pull by and they'd say, you, come on, buddy, you can get out. No, 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 I'm good right where I'm at. By the time they were done, I was singing that song in Chinese. <laughs> All right? I, it was just a refreshing thing. Why? Because I was tired. I was worn out. And, and I just needed this refreshment. God does that to us spiritually. Boy, he's been doing that here lately in our church. Just bring a time of refreshment, a time of saying, hey, God, I know what you need, and I'm going to refresh you, and I'm going to encourage you. It, it reminds me that, that very often we get way down, and the thing that wears out our life is our sin. Sin, the Bible it describes it as a burden or a weight. It wears us down. It, it wears us out. Psalm 23, David describes that or 32, rather. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day. David says, when I kept silent, when I didn't deal with my sin, he's talking about the sin with Bathsheba there. He says, it felt like the whole world was sitting on my shoulders. It was just weighing me down. He says the same thing in Psalm 38, verse 4. He says, for my iniquities are gone over my head. He feels like he's drowning in them. He says, a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. Some of you have walked in here this morning, and you're unbelievers. You've not come to know Christ, and the, the weight of sin is burdening you down. Sin will wear you out. Oh, it's fun for the first little bit, but it'll wear you out. And you're saying, what can help? What can take away this burden? What can take away this pain in my life? I tell you, his name is Jesus. Some of you are believers, and for one reason or the other, you've fallen back into an old habit, and now you're carrying around that burden with you. I got good news. Jesus can take it off. He bore our guilt. He took our sins to give us new life, and when he comes to us, he lifts that burden. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is standing up, and he's preaching, and listen to what he says. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Listen to what he says. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You need refreshment today. You don't need it's a small world. You need a great big Savior. Amen? You need someone who can come and refresh your soul. Psalm 68 verse 19 says, Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burdens. i got good news for you. When we're weak, Jesus is strong. Amen? When we're weak, when we're worn out, when we can't go any further, when we can't take another step, Jesus is there with us. I love what John Wesley said. He was write, writing to a fellow minister, and here's what he said. This, this minister he was writing to was struggling and considering quitting the ministry. And John Wesley wrote these words, you look inward too much and outward too little. You know what he's saying there? I would change that phrase a little bit. I know that uh, I may not be as profound as Wesley, but I would take outward and I would put it upward. Sometimes we're so busy looking at inside and we forget our job is to look up. Keep our eyes on Jesus. That's who refreshes us. There, there's a, another thing it says here in the psalm. Not only does he uh, calm us and refresh us, but he guides us. Look what he says in the next verse. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sheep cannot be driven. They have to be led. Jesus is a good shepherd who goes out in front of us and leads us and guides us every step of the way. I want you to hear this. Jesus showed us how to live the Christian life while he was here. He demonstrated. He was our pioneer. He was our forerunner. He indwells us through the Holy Spirit as believers to guide and to direct us and to help us. That's why in John chapter 16, verse 13, he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. I want to say this to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, your job is incredibly easy. Your job's incredibly easy. 
follow. That's what it is. Remember when Jesus would show up and talk to his disciples? Remember when he called his disciples? Follow me. That's the essence of discipleship. It is following Jesus. And here's what happens. The more you grow in your relationship with him, the more you know, the more you're able to see what he's doing, the more the desires of his heart become your heart, and you simply follow him. Now, this is not for your glory, and this is not so that you will get famous, but rather so he will. Did you notice what he says? Lead me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Jesus is doing some amazing things. I'll just be honest with you. I'll tell you more about this one other day. But we watched God do an absolute miracle right there last Sunday morning. A few weeks before that, he did even more miracles. As great as that miracle was, when God saves a soul, he says he brings them from death to life. The greatest miracle in all of the universe is when God takes a dead sinner and makes them alive in Christ Jesus. He's reminding us. He guides us for his namesake. Not so that we can get the glory, but so he can get the glory. So that he can get the honor. Not only does he guide us, but look what he says in verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I've, I've tossed around how to label this all week, and, and here's what I've come up with. He protects us. He simply protects us. One of the primary jobs of a shepherd was to protect his sheep. Sheep are essentially defenseless animals. You probably never hear of a dude getting mauled by a pack of domesticated sheep. Poor old farmer walked down in his field, and the sheep turned on him and went after him. They don't do that. They're pretty much defenseless. They can do two things. Well, three things. They can, they can kind of squeal and go, bah, and try to scare it away. They can try to run, but have you ever watched a, a sheep that has a lot of wool on him? Have you ever watched him try to run? Mm, not very agile. He can also try to kick you. The only problem is his legs aren't all that long. He's not very good at it. They're just not very good at defending themselves, so they need a shepherd. Now think about that. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's reminding us of something here that you need to understand. As believers, there'll be moments when we go some, through some scary places. The valley was a great place for refreshment in one sense. That's where the good grass is. That's where the water is. That's also where the predators are at. But he reminds us of something. It's just the shadow of death. What's a shadow? It's not the real thing. My grandson, Max, scared of a shadow. I love messing with him on it. He comes in, he gets up, he'd be walking around. Max, look! Ah! And he runs from it. And he's fought it a few times. But you never have to be scared of a shadow. It's not the real thing. It's just a figment. It's just a, a reflection. And he's reminding us of something as believers. Death no longer has mastery over us. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5, Oh, death, where is your sting? Why can the believer not be mastered and afraid and scared of death any longer? Because Jesus defeated it on our behalf. He laid down his life, paying the penalty for our sin, and the Bible says he took up his life again. And what's even greater is the Bible says he's just the first fruits of the resurrection. One day... One day, the Bible says, you and I will be like him if you have put your faith in Christ. We have a predator that's constantly looking for us, constantly defending us, but we have a shepherd who watches over us, who protects us, who guarantees that even death, even death, the thing we fear more than anything else, we fight tooth and nail against death, do we not? 
We have surgeries. We have treatments. We do all kinds. And those are all good things. We wage against death. And yet for the believer, there is no fear. It cannot touch us because ultimately God is with us. I love what he says. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. No matter what you're going through in this life, no matter what's happening in your life, if you're a believer, Jesus is right there beside you. Amen? He's right there. He's right there in the good times. He's right there in the bad times. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. He walks through it. And even at the hour of our death, he's there. Oh, I've watched it hundreds of times. Sitting at the bed of a a dear beloved saint as they're departing the world. And, And there's this moment that happens sometimes. It's precious. I'm not sure what all is happening there, but it's as if the person is caught between heaven and hell, or heaven and earth. They're, they're just kind of there. Their body's still here, and, and, and they're still partly there, but, but they're seen. I can remember with my dad in the hospital, about to die. Died the very next day. His, his, his sisters had come to visit him, and they were saying, well, Buck, maybe, maybe you'll get to go home soon. And he kept shaking his head, no, I'm going there. And he would point up. Every time he'd talk about heaven, he'd point to the corner of the room, and I don't know, I don't know for sure, but I believe in my heart that God had just given him a little glimpse of there. Amen? He reminds us that he walks through us. Every problem you have, he is with you. And then he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now I'm going to tell you, if you read the literature on this psalm, you'll find that there are dozens and dozens and dozens of pages, lots of different ways of interpreting this. Um, The rod and the staff were used to discipline the sheep. But in this context, I don't think that makes any sense. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Those were tools of protection that the shepherd could use to drive off all of the enemies. But there's something else that I didn't know until this week. When the shepherd wants to count his sheep, he gets up towards the pen and he holds out his rod over top. And the Bible uses the description of the sheep going beneath the rod. That's how he counted his sheep. That's how he counted them. I don't know if it was just a number, if he touched each one, one, two, three, four, five. But it's a reminder to me that he isn't going to lose any of them. They're his sheep. He counts them. He knows them. The number that he took out, that's the number he's bringing back. Amen? The good news is that Jesus knows you, and he guides you, and he protects you. There's a Fourth or third thing I want to show you in this passage. Not only does it invite us into a personal relationship and reminds us that God provides every need, but he reminds us that God provides hope for both this life and the next. Don't know if you noticed it, but in verse 5, the metaphor changes. He's no longer talking about sheep and shepherds. Now suddenly, everything about it has changed. The perspective has changed. He's no longer talking in the third person, he's talking in the first person. And he's no longer talking about sheep and shepherds, he's talking about a host and his guests. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The image of having a table set before one's enemies has, again, a lot of applications. But I want us to think about this picture today. Jews did not like to sit down with people that were outside of their immediate family or outside of their their immediate friend group. In fact, they often wouldn't sit with their friends. They were very picky about table manners and who sat down with them. Jesus says, you set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I got thinking about that this week. Think about what happens as a result of the gospel. Jesus unites people who normally wouldn't get along together. Think about the disciples for a minute. Think about the disciples for a moment. You talk about a group of people that were not naturally going to get along together. You had religious zealots 
sitting and eating with tax collectors. You had fishermen sitting with devout Jews that would never have, have thought about doing anything unclean. And, and these are a group of guys that are custom built not to get along with each other. They were often enemies of each other. And yet they sit down together. Think about the early disciples and the early followers of Jesus. Paul writes to a guy named Philemon, or um, to a guy named Philemon who was a slave owner. He has a runaway slave named Onesimus, two people that shouldn't have been getting along together. But Saul says, on the basis of the gospel, you're now brothers. Think about what he does with us. He brings us together. One of the beautiful things about the church we all have different backgrounds. Some of us grew up in the church most of our lives, if not all of our lives. Some have just come in recently. We've got people here who lived pretty straight and narrow and, and, and respectable lives, and then we have others that came in and said, man, I made a mess. The good news is they all came to Jesus the exact same way. Amen? And he invites us all to come. Today we're going to celebrate that unity. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're reminding us we're all different. We've all come in from different backgrounds, but we all came in through the same gate. We all came in needing the same salvation. And he unites us together. He provides not only what we need here on earth, but ultimately, I love what David says. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. No no ifs, no ands, no buts. David says, because you're my shepherd, I know where I'm spending eternity. I know where I'm going. Amen? I want to ask you today, very honestly, very seriously, every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you a question. No one looking around. I want to ask you an honest to goodness question. If you're here today and you can say without a shadow of a doubt, Pastor, I can say the Lord is my shepherd because I have turned away from my sin. I have trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm not trusting in my good works. I'm not trusting in my church membership. Jesus died on the cross for me. He paid the penalty for my sin, and I believe it. And today, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when I die, I'll spend eternity with him. I know that I know that I know I'm saved. When I die, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you could honestly say that, would you raise your hand right now? Pastor, I know it. Amen. With your hand still up, let me just ask you this. Are you trusting him the way David did? Think about that list we just went through. Are you trusting him to be, to calm you, to provide for you, to protect you? Is there something God has spoken to your heart today and you said, you know what, I'm really not following him the way that I ought to. I'm a believer, but man, I haven't been living the Christian life quite the way I should. Maybe you've never become a part of a local church. And today, God's speaking to your heart. I want to invite you, you put your hands down, now, to come to the altar and say, here I am, Lord, use me. Maybe there's an area of your life where you know you haven't been following him the way you ought to. He's been calling you to some area of service or some area of ministry. There's some habit in your life that you need to get rid of. And today, you just need to come and say, Lord Jesus, here I am. But then I want to talk to that second group. If you couldn't lift your hand, I want to ask you today, would you come today, grab me by the hand and say, Pastor, today I need to be saved. Today I need Jesus to be my shepherd. The Bible tells you exactly how to do this. It's really simple. You repent of your sin. It means just you're turning away. You recognize and you acknowledge, I've been sinning. I haven't been following Jesus. And today I'm turning away from that. And I'm putting my trust in him. Now, there may have been a day where you prayed a prayer, but you never really put your trust in him. Might have been a day when you were baptized, but you never really trusted him. Today I'm asking you, have you really trusted him? If you can't say that, would you come today? Grab me by the hand and say, Pastor, today I need to be saved. I'll have someone take a side and share with you and talk to you. I'll be very honest. It's a very simple matter. Just simply right now, bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I'm turning away from my sin and I'm trusting you. 
When you died on the cross, I believe that you died in my place. You paid the penalty for my sin. And now today, I'm giving my heart and life to you. 